602, I officially call this meeting to order. And we have roll call, please. Commissioner Dinko? Here. Commissioner Perillo will be marked absent. Commissioner Ward? Here. Chair DeCosta? Present. Thank you. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Presentations and announcements. Do we have a code enforcement update? 3.1? Yes, sir, we do. Before we start with that, I just want to welcome you to our new council chambers here at City Hall um, and your brand new dais. You're breaking it in before City Council gets to break in the brand new dais. So consider yourself privileged uh, um, and uh, welcome to City Hall. We'll be, we're going to be on October 24th, council meeting. We're going to have a grand opening. This is all considered soft opening, getting all the... the the kinks out of everything that's working but um, if you haven't noticed um, there's a button to turn your mic on and when it's red it's on and when it's not red it's off so um, but we are we are welcoming you guys to your first uh, meeting here at, at the new council chambers and we're excited to have all future and have control of the air conditioning and the milkman and everything like that we really appreciate the being at rosa parks uh, but we really like having control of our own space and and having a quaint little space right here where the community can come by, come in and participate um so uh thank you for being here tonight thank you as well and it's much appreciated and i think a long time coming for the city to have its own establishment. So it's nice to see we're still growing and still thriving. East Vale strong. Yeah, so it's, it's city staff and the contractors and everybody worked really hard to get us into our first council meeting September 12th. And so we, we slid in head first with a few bruises and a lot of dust, but we made it to the se September 12th uh, soft opening for the first council meeting. So we were pretty excited about that. So a lot of heavy lifting and hard work and uh, uh, call, calling of audibles during construction, but we made it happen. So um, uh, a lot of kudos to our city clerk, Stephen Aguilar and his team, and as well as many other on the Eastville management team uh, that uh, were doing their regular duties as well as construction management on this construction project. So uh, it, was, it was a great effort by all. Good evening, Chair DeCosta, Commissioners, City staff, and members of the public. This code enforcement update report reflects 90 days beginning July 1st, 2018 through September 25th, 2018. It includes code enforcement activities such as street sweeping, enforcement, code enforcement cases, signs, and staff updates. For this reporting period, we have removed a total of 1,803 illegally posted signs throughout the city. For this reporting quarter, our two street sweeping enforcement officers issued a total of 3,223 street sweeping citations. Last quarter, we issued a total of 1,511 citations, a difference and an increase of 1,712 additional citations. Please note that last quarter, we only had one street sweeping enforcement officer on duty during that period. Code enforcement has responded to over 400 cases within the last 90 days. Of those cases, we currently have 232 cases open. Our average case created per day is four cases per day with an average time it takes to close the day is 15 days. At this time, our quickest turnaround for closed cases continues to be building issues and the slowest case uh, type are property violations such as weeds, overgrown vegetation, junk debris in public view and inoperable vehicles. Our most common case type of violations consists of overgrown vegetation, inoperable vehicles, trash cans and junk in public view. Staff updates. Our current staff levels are as follows. We currently have one senior full-time code enforcement officer, one full-time code enforcement officer, one full-time code enforcement technician, 
two part-time code enforcement street sweeping technicians and one part-time code enforcement officer dedicated to signage on Sundays only. We are in the process of hiring a full-time office assistant. This will bring our staffing levels to a total of seven staff members in our department. Once again, this includes full-time and part-time staff. Once we are at full staffing levels, we will be shifting from a complaint-driven code enforcement department to a proactive code enforcement department. We anticipate being proactive by the end of the year or in early January 2019. This concludes my report. I am more than happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you again. No questions from the panel. Thank you for your report. Thank you, sir. Next item, monthly police department update. Sergeant. Good evening, Chair DeCosti and Commissioners. I'll go over the, the months of July and August for the police report numbers. Calls for service for the month of July, we had 2,212. 2, for the month of August, we had 2,432, which was a 9% increase. Total traffic collisions for the month of July was 69, and in August we had 75, which was an 8% increase. Out of those uh, traffic collisions for the month of July, we had 12 that were injury traffic collisions. The month of August, we had 8, which was a 33% decrease. The non-injury traffic collisions, we for the month of July, we had 57, and the month of August, we had 67, which was a 17% increase. Total citations for the month of July, 307 citations were written. And the month of August, 551, which was a 79% increase. Out of those citations for the month of July, moving citations was 196. The month of August was 339, which is a 72% increase. Parking violation citations for the month of July was 111. For the month of August, we had 212, which was a 90% increase. Vehicle burglaries for the month of July, we had 14. For the month of August, we had 20, which is a 42% increase. Uh, 415 noise calls for the month of July, we had 86. For the month of August, we, we had 69, which is a 19% decrease. Reported mail thefts for the month of July, we had um, 10. And for the month of August, we had 6, which is a 40% decrease. Our UCR stats for the month of July, we had uh, zero homicides, zero reported rapes, three robberies, four aggravated assaults, nine burglaries, 42 thefts, 16 vehicle thefts, and zero arsons. Um, the August UCR stats weren't available at this time. Um, I'm available for any questions if you, if you have any. I don't know if you can see me, sir. It's Commissioner yes, Ward. Um, on the uh, three robberies, I, I know a couple of uh, meetings ago I talked about those and I wanted to know the categories, like were they street 211s or were they um, business 211s? Uh, so I have the same question. That will probably be my question whenever there's an occurrence of a robbery in the city. What type of robberies were they? The ones for this this month, and I've looked at every month when I do these stats, I look at the robberies and I read the, re read the reports and the calls for service. Um, these ones were, were the typical ones we usually have. Um, I believe one was a was a strong arm robbery, and these are just random robberies. These are more like the um, people meeting to sell something in a public spot, things like that. We, they're it's just they don't seem like they're connected. They're just random. One was a, also a, a shoplifting that turned into a robbery, so it's more of a strong arm robberies. And just a final follow up question: Are they happening in? any particular part of the city or is it pretty sporadic? Sporadic. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat> Christian Dick on a follow up on the robberies. I know that uh, I appreciate every time we bring this up at the meetings about the types of robberies and I think there's a significant difference between an Estes robbery at a, a shopping center and a, a random street robbery. So, you know, a random street robbery is a lot more concerning because it could happen to anyone, I mean, when loss prevention goes after somebody, and then it turns a a, a, uh, a theft turns into a robbery. That we understand those kind of things will happen, but if we're talking about something random, a little bit clarification on those is always helpful. 
majority of the time with with the ones that I've that I've read and the ones that we're going over this last month are people put themselves in situations more likely where like the shoplifting or they meet up with somebody to sell something or buy something. It's not just someone coming out of the shopping center and getting robbed in the parking lot. Most of them are Craigslist. Yeah. Okay, that helps. I appreciate okay. that. Thank You're you. You're welcome. I have no questions, so I'll spare you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Moving on, uh, monthly fire department update, sir. Welcome, Chief. Thank you. Good evening, Chair DeCosta and Commissioners. Uh, it's been a while since I've been here, and I apologize for that. We've been uh, extremely busy this summer, as you can uh, have seen lately. So uh, what I did is I pulled report stats uh, from July 1st through today uh, for you for the city. City total, uh, 723 calls for service for the fire department. Of those calls, 71.8% of those are medical aid uh, related calls. We break them down uh, from false alarms, hazmats, uh, medical aids, and, and different fires and traffic collisions. So uh, with traffic collisions, 10.9% uh, of those, and we don't break them down like the sheriff's department does, whether they were injury or non-injury. It's just if we responded to a reported traffic collision. So for the city um, in that time frame was 79 of those, and, and like I said, 10.9%. Um, average response time from time of the 911 dispatch uh, to arrival at scene, uh, 4.8 minutes for the city. Uh, station 27 had the 4.8 minutes and uh, station 31 had a 4.9 minute response time. And breaking down uh, the different stations, 27 still seems uh, to be our busier station uh, of the total calls, 568 calls for service or station 31 uh, counted for 251 of those calls. Um, Stations 31 and 27 were both involved in uh, both of the large fires that were in the county, being the Cranston Fire and the Holy Fire. Um, I was uh, lucky enough to take Engine 31 with me on my strike team up to Idlewild. Um, we showed up that evening, and uh, there were already houses that were on fire in the neighborhood that we got assigned to. Um, we, we got in there, did a lot of good work, and, and, and I can say we saved a lot of houses that night. So um, it was good to have that engine up, up there with me, and uh, we also had 27 out on the Holy Fire. I didn't have either one of those engines on a strike team with me. Uh, when I went to that fire, however, they were there on other strike teams. So um, we definitely give that mutual aid uh, response component to our, our local partners. Um, as early as today, we had Engine 27 and 31 in the city of Corona. Uh, they had a fire over there off of uh, Albert Hill down in their river bottom type area. Um, so we had both of our engines over there assisting our Corona partners as well. And that concludes my report, and I have, uh, I'm here to answer questions if you have any. And just to reiterate, when our engines go on mutual aid, we have engines come back and backfill our city, so we're never without an engine. So, Yeah, absolutely. Just today we had engines covering from uh, other parts of the county that would come in and cover our stations for us. Thank you. No questions from the panel. Thank you. 3.4. Update on the Neighborhood Watch Program, Don Pettinger. Welcome, sir. Thank you. The mic is on now? Okay. Don't want anybody randomly come up here and start singing. Well, good evening. Uh, this is an in-depth uh, Neighborhood Watch report since we haven't had the privilege of giving it or presenting it to the Public Safety Commission since the our start of this last year. So uh, we've had different things that have come up. But anyway, um, we'd like to just kind of share with you what's going on as we go to the first slide. Anyway, uh, the layout and foundation of our Neighborhood Watch program is completely different than other programs. It's made up of a number of components. Uh, first off, it's our quarterly captain's meeting. And that's where we bring all the captains of the different zones within our city together every quarter and we go over important things and we teach them. These are teaching meetings that they can take back to their individual neighborhoods. Uh, we've been very blessed to have some really good meetings that have taught some things and had some great guest speakers that we'll talk about a little bit later. We have a, uh, creates community accountability. Uh, each of the different zones, we have 29 of them within the city, uh, are accountable for running their Facebook pages and making sure things are posted and approve people only within their zones on that page. We also have a business watch component that will be coming soon now that the neighborhoods are all done. We will be working with uh, Joe uh, to determine how those uh, zones are gonna be broken up and we're gonna be working with the business owners and the managers to create uh, business watches within those areas. Uh, finally, we're hoping this is gonna be a framework for other cities 
Uh, we've already had a couple of chiefs of police contact us and ask for the format, how we've done it, and different things like that. And it's also providing a base for data, such as camera cert and et cetera. Um, and the thing that you see to the right is the flyer that was handed out in all 29 of the zones prior to a neighborhood watch being uh, meeting being conducted. Uh, most importantly, Captain Hedge and Lieutenant Martin need big props and kudos uh, for their willingness to help uh, us through this entire process and knock down a lot of walls that needed to be knocked down as we went forward and supplying any necessary help along the way. Uh, just for, for information, this is the city, uh, Los Angeles, California, and uh, no, that's the start of Dragnet. Uh, let's see here, this is our city, and um, it shows that there's 30 zones, but we combined one zone, so number 15 is a TBD, and if you look on here, each of those zones have defined boundaries, and that's what makes up the different neighborhood watches within our city. And uh, we feel this is a really good process. We didn't create these zones. We kind of pulled them from what was pre-existing in the city as natural boundaries, and we took the names that were there for those. As we move on to our next slide, um, if you take a look at the zones right there broken down, one of the big things that we've been able to do is to really make an emphasis about neighborhood watch within our city. Uh, since the start of this program last, uh, the end of April, we have been able to install 150 signs. There were 10 old neighborhood watch signs. And big thanks go to Joe and Darwin and his staff uh, for coordinating this with the construction crews to get those signs up. If you look at the little red dots, that's where signs are everywhere within our community. And it's really pretty amazing if you uh, look at how many signs are out there letting the bad guys know, hey, we're neighborhood watch, move on over to Chino or Ontario or someplace else that ROSO doesn't take care of. Uh, but if you take a look there, the area that would kind of be concerning would be area 20, uh, hard side, and 21, the enclave, and four, which is Starling Green. They do not have any neighborhood watch sign presence in those neighborhoods. Uh, they're working on it. The enclave says they've got them and they're going to put them up, but it just hasn't happened. And then number four, Starling Green, you can notice a little uh, spattering of signs up in the corner. That was uh, signs that they had put up a long time ago. Uh, that are going to need to gradually be replaced because they're wearing. And uh, Dave Ruggio, the captain in that area, has already collected enough money to purchase five additional signs. So those should be coming to Joe's office probably within the month uh, to be able to get installed. But in addition, that little sticker to the right there, that's a decal. We have handed out over 3,000 of those that have been put in windows uh, throughout our neighborhood. And we're looking at trying to get additional ones. If you take a look at the signs there on the pictures, uh, they're being posted at the entrances and exits to every community. While there's not a neighborhood watch sign on every street, it's just like street sweeping. You know, you'll see the sign before you come into the community, so there's no excuse. And they've done an excellent job of utilizing current construction uh, to be able to post those signs. And uh, I'd really like to thank Joe and his entire team for being willing to work with that. Another unique thing that our neighborhood watch program has had, and this is really uh, thanks to uh, the captain and the LT for thinking outside the box and uh, letting us venture out a little further than normal. We've created databases for an Eastvale emergency response camera database. And it's through a secure server on Google. And basically, community members are able to go in. They're able to log their name, their address, uh, their email, and they're able to respond if they have a ring doorbell, uh, an exterior camera system, or both. And everywhere you see those little dots, uh, that's where cameras or ring doorbells currently exist or uh, external cam cameras only. If we move over, uh, this is a little bit more of what you see. Like if you were to go over to Erica Court, you would see that there's two houses right across the street from each other that have external and ring doorbells. Over on the corner of Erica, there's a ring doorbell only. And uh, as you come out, uh, there's a camera system on Peach Blossom. What this does is hopefully we're going to get enough citizens to be able to put this data in. And once it's fully working, uh, Captain Hedge and Lieutenant Martin have told us we'll be able to get this put in the patrol cars. So deputy rolls up on a burglary or some type of crime investigation, he can immediately go uh, to his computer in his car, type in the address, pull up the map, and it'll tell him where every camera is, the phone contact of the person who owns that camera. So he's able to cut his investigation time and in, you know, virtually uh, 
in half, you know, so he doesn't have to go knocking at every door looking to see if they're real cameras. He can make phone calls right from his patrol car uh, to gain access and ask them to send him, them copies and things like that. So that's something we're really working on. The database is secured. Uh, only the deputies would be able to access it from their patrol car. The way we would have it set up is you wouldn't be able to access it from a home computer or anything like that. Uh, and it's completely voluntary. We're getting more and more neighbors on board. Uh, 719 was when we introduced it at our last um, captain's meeting. And right now we have 150 residents who've uh, entered data for cameras. I know on my block, which is Erica Court, there's still four neighbors that didn't quite figure out how to go on and, and log everything. So we're hoping this is gonna be an excellent tool for law enforcement as they pull up, they can get information quickly and possibly broadcast that out to other units to be able to do things. Uh, neighborhood Watch, the reason it's working is we're having results. Uh, some of you may have never seen these pictures, but the whole point of Neighborhood Watch is see something, say something. Uh, the one picture you see right there of the two gentlemen riding the motorcycle that was stolen out of a garage and it was posted on the crime page and uh, it immediately was posted on all the Neighborhood Watch pages. Within moments, we had people, that motorcycle just drove by here, that motorcycle just drove by here. I just took a picture of the motorcycle. And um, within a few minutes after that, we had the, S the uh, school resource officer uh, saying, I know exactly who those guys are and they were waiting for them when they got home. So um, this was able to do the gentleman on the right, uh, suspicious activity was noticed and uh, people followed the protocol, contacted RSO and arrests were able to be made. Uh, if you look at this right here, as, a, as a, a direct response of people through Neighborhood Watch, the gentleman on the right was one of the guys on the motorcycle and the gentleman on the left, these were call-ins uh, from community members who possibly in the past never would have been involved to call uh, especially with the motorcycle caper, uh, because the fact they wouldn't have had any way of knowing that there was a missing motorcycle. They would have probably read about in the newspaper. But uh, what is so unique about this, and the thing that's great about the administration at the Sheriff's Department, so they take this seriously, they're using it with the deputies, and we're seeing a, a paradigm shift with the deputies as far as how they're utilizing the information, and we think that's terrific. Now on January 3rd, to show you how important Neighborhood Watch is, January 3rd, this photo was issued in an attempt to identify by the Riverside County Sheriff's Department. Many of you guys remember the attempted burglary of the Pomona police officer's home uh, where shots were fired. These pictures were posted. Uh, we had these pictures prior to them being posted because the guy who had the cameras immediately sent them to us. We didn't put them out yet because we were asked to hold them. So on January 3rd, when RSO posted this, we sent them this response on January 4th. Uh, we sent this. We were looking at these photos of the two guys who stole the motorcycle a few months ago and are wondering if the guy in the back matches the motorcycle guy on, the, on flyer number one. And we received an email back from Captain Hedge. Thank you very much. I possibly see similarities. And we'll pass along to robbery homicide and see what they have to say. And then the guy in the middle, guess what? Bingo! They arrest him. And it was the guy from the motorcycle. So Eastville burglar who broke into Pomona police officer's home, cumulated in gunfire, sentenced. So uh, I guess he's working for Justin now from what the reports say, uh, putting out fire somewhere. But anyway, and that shows the ability of people working together and gathering data. And it was a great partnership. And, you know, the sheriff's department's not proud enough to say thank you. And in press releases and things like that, they, they noted, hey, because of community involvement, we were able to move forward on things like this. And that's where our captain and our LT really need to be commended for doing that and moving forward. So let me see here. So as we started Neighborhood Watch in April, uh, Neighborhood Watch was birthed uh, after we've had some conversations with uh, Councilman Plot and Councilman Rigby. One of the big things that caused this birthing of Neighborhood Watch was the mail theft. Mail theft was happening every day. You went on Facebook, my mailbox got broken into, my mailbox got broken into, and it just continued to be a uh, point of contention within our city. So in April was when we started our first set of neighborhood watch meetings and we talked about addressing mail theft and we talked about putting cameras in, we talked about lighting uh, the mailboxes up and using personal property to improve things. And we even you know, stretched the federal law a little bit as far as with the community members, as far as what they could put and not put on mailboxes, kind of like don't ask, don't tell. And we were seeing more and more people focusing their cameras on them and if you take a look here from April until May, when our last meeting took place in 18, 
uh, there was a definite decline in mail thefts and burglaries. Um, and if you kind of look back, we've had a lot of people calling in. Uh, I can give you more examples of the lady who saw the people jumping the fence, called in, RSO responded promptly, and arrested three guys that had just burglarized a house. And we're really creating the uh, Gladys Kravis approach. You know, be that nosy neighbor, be someone who call RSO and let them investigate it. So we're seeing a decrease. We'd like to think that Neighborhood Watch played a, a big part in that. And uh, along with the great work of our police department, uh, we also noticed, you know, 10 and 6 was the next two uh, mail thefts that didn't get recorded on there. Another big thing with this neighborhood watch is community involvement. We want our neighbors to get out in the community. We had a booth set up at the Corona Norco Unified School District's 510K run, getting people signed up to have meetings. We were handing out flyers. Uh, we were showing the, the zones that, hey, you need to get involved. You need to be on your neighborhood page. We were out at National Night Out trying to get people uh, to come out and really look at the table and learn about being a captain and finding ways they can help. In addition, at our captain's training, I told you we were really blessed to have people. We had the sheriff uh, come out, Stan came and addressed uh, 79 captains that we had there. So to get 79 people anywhere is pretty amazing. And if you look at the pictures on the lower right and left, those are pictures of neighborhood watch meetings. And prior to doing this, you know, the average neighborhood watch meeting had 10, 11 people. They'd have their meeting and it would fizzle out within a month or two. Okay, it's all done, the excitement's over. And until somebody's house gets burglarized or a car gets stolen, uh, it's, it's dead. But the nice thing here is the captains are keeping it relevant and the pages are keeping relevant. So here's a little bit of community involvement. Our very first captain's meeting was the one on the right there where Brandon's given the thumbs up. I think we had seven. So we moved from, 70 to, from seven to 70 in a year. And uh, we were really excited about that. And then the neighborhood meetings are continuing as we recycle through. Celebrating success, it's important. Whenever you win, you need to celebrate your successes. Keep the troops happy. Uh, we are going to be having on Saturday, October 6th, a giant celebration, the big day of the Harvest Festival uh, that JCSD is putting on. And they've partnered alongside us to uh, supply us with the stage that we're able to do uh, presentations from. We have a local band surge uh, that we found at one of our neighborhood watch meetings. We're going to have bounce houses and just a chance for each of the neighborhoods to come celebrate. Hey, Heartland's the best. No, Fieldmaster's the best. And just kind of have games like that and be able to really start to enhance the, the main points of neighborhood watch. And that is knowing your neighbors. And uh, we're very grateful for what JCSD has done, the fire department, as well as the police department and being willing to come out and support us and the city uh, for being able to create this uh, amazing flyer and everything for us. Anyway, uh, back in the old days with Sports Illustrated, you used to be able to see by the numbers at the back, which was really kind of cool. We've handed out over almost 13,000 flyers in the city uh, announcing neighborhood watch meetings. Uh, we have almost, we're five shy of 8,000 members on the Eastville Crime Watch and Reporting page. 3,000 window clings have been handed out in the neighbor neighborhoods and put up. 2,618 residents are on the neighborhood pages. Uh, you know, almost 1,800 residents have attended meetings. These are parents that are people that have come out and listened to us in the sheriff's department about ways they can improve. 203 pizzas were provided at meetings. So I think the cells are down at Little Caesars now that the meetings have kind of stopped. They're wondering what's going on. Uh, 150 neighborhood watch signs have been posted up. We have an average of 132 residents per local page. 100% uh, of the city has completed neighborhood watch. We have 86 active captains, uh, 29 neighborhood watch zones, uh, 16 uh, number of months program has been going at this point. We've conducted six quarterly captains meetings. The first had 12 and the last had 78. And we're gonna finish it up with one giant celebration coming up here soon. And uh, all of this was done uh, with very minimal cost to the city as far as the flyers and the signs, uh, along with the meetings and the pizza. There was no expenditures or public dollars utilized for this. It was all done by donations. I'll entertain any questions the commission has. Great job once again, Don. Thanks Thank for you. the uh, update. Don, if someone in any neighborhood throughout Eastvale wanted to get actively involved in uh, the Community Watch program, what would you tell them? How would they start? 
Uh, number one, they can contact myself or Brandon Plot or Todd Rigby. And uh, if they're on the crime page, they can just say, hey, I want to be part of Neighborhood Watch. Uh, what zone am I in? We'll put the map up and they'll still ask, what zone am I in? Mm -hmm. All right, what street do you live on? We'll do the work for you. And then we'll tell them what zone they live in and sign up for that page. All they have to do is enter their street name and the captains will vet them back and forth and put them on the page and we'll invite them to the next meeting. Don, I've been associated with Neighborhood Watches over the many years um, of my, my work and I've never really seen it uh, take hold as quickly and as effectively as it has here in Eastville through your leadership and, and uh, Todd and Brandon's and I'm really, really impressed with all that you've done and what about a year and a half? Mm -hmm. It's fantastic and given a vehicle for all our uh, well-meaning citizens and neighborhoods to uh, actively get involved without having to come to a formalized meeting like this um, has been fantastic and uh, I'm really impressed. I'm excited about the upcoming event at Harada. Uh, I'll be there, but I remember when we first started talking about that, or I had uh, Todd and Brandon talking about it, and I wasn't sure how it would look with the the uh, designed organization of setting it up and creating the uh, Facebook pages, and it really came out far better than I ever expected. So kudos to you, and thank you to your leadership for the Na Neighborhood Watch program. I'm super impressed, and I'm really impressed with the, the uh, video cataloging um, of neighborhoods with video cameras um, becoming more and more prevalent and cheaper. Um, I've been seeing those pop up and I've never really seen one at work and that's uh, great. I think it's only going to expand our, our deputies' ability to solve crimes and identify suspects. So uh, thank you for all aspects of the program. Uh, I know. Um, excellent job. I'm, I'm very proud of the work you've done. Thank you. It goes without saying that I have to say thank you. And as well with the council members, uh, Rigby and Plot for their assistance with this and partnership, as well as RSO and uh, for Stan to even come out, make himself available on more than one occasion to our city when events come about. It just goes to show that uh, there's a lot of citizens that stand behind this movement that want to stop crime or keep it out of bands, send it to other cities, and the Neighborhood Watch program is definitely doing that, I believe. Uh, I attended the second Neighborhood Watch captain's meeting, and the one thing that uh, I think has lost its fizzle, and maybe you could shed some light on how we might be able to bring it back to the forefront of light as we're talking about it, is the camera database. I hadn't seen or heard anything since it was implemented and the website was going to be set up and then it was sent out and then there was nothing in it any further. So I'm hoping we might be able to get back to bringing that to light once again because I failed to even remember to log my information. So it, it is something that we're going to be readdressing. Uh, what It took a backseat to the, uh, the neighborhood watch success party. We were pushing all of a sudden, now yeah. it's time for the party. And then because all these fires and the smoke issues, we couldn't do it. And uh, so we got postponed and then, okay, we were going to come back, but uh, not to make excuses, but it just, the three of us kind of got overwhelmed. And so we sat down, looked at it again. We're still happy that we have over a hundred cameras already listed, but that's going to be the big push. And the biggest, the biggest thing about this is it's a sustainable program. We don't want to see it to go away. And city manager Jones has done an amazing job of coming alongside us and saying, okay, what can we do as a city to continue to expand this, put fertilizer on it? so it grows and flourish. And so he's kind of like now taking the ball and helping us take it to the next level as he's been talking with the council and things like that. And that's what's gonna to happen to make this like no other. But yeah, we're gonna to continue to push on the cameras. We believe when we have right about 200, we'll sit down with LT and Captain again to transfer the database to them. And then we would update it every month so they can upload it. One question, I don't remember seeing anything in our Eastfield Weekly, maybe we've put it out but with regard to the camera system. Yeah, nothing had been put out there. Uh, the only thing that comes out in Eastville Weekly is whenever I do a presentation at the meeting there, then she recaps and puts it out. And the last meeting I was at was before we introduced the camera system. So. Okay, thank you. 
So I look forward to after celebratory uh, the experience okay. coming on October 6th. We might be able to reconsider reintroducing that once again. You so bet. I think it's very effective. All right. Okay. And I uh, thank you for your time tonight, right. sir. Thanks for having me. And, uh, you know, just remember to thank Brandon Plott and Todd Rigby. They were there along the way with RSO uh, to make this all possible. Thanks, guys. Will do. Thank you. Hey, if I might just add a few uh, uh, thoughts and thanks to, to, to Don. Um, you know, I think it was reflective in the state of the city when he was awarded what, resident of the year. Um, and for all his contributions, both to this neighborhood watch program and to to the the community garden over at Station Twenty Seven, um, and so this is no small feat, and this is definitely what we as a young community like Eastville are looking for residents um, to step up and um, be part of the stakeholders and be part of the solution. Uh, a lot of times, community uh, cities and local governments are asked to be the hub of a wheel and really thriving cities are when the city no longer becomes the hub and the city just becomes a stakeholder and we have a whole bunch of stakeholders and we put the problem in the, in the hub and we're all working to solve it. And so, um, you know, this is a, an example where the city isn't the hub um, and we're just one of the stakeholders and in, um, in talking with council members, uh, Plot and Rigby, um, as well as at the August 24th, Council strategic priority uh, workshop that we did. One of the priorities that came out of that was how can the city um, insert um, themselves into this neighborhood watch program to help it go to the next level. Um, you know, when you ask somebody that is working full time, uh, two or three full time jobs plus all his volunteer hours that he does um, to to do all the administration and and the heavy lifting along with my two council members. Uh, um, it's a lot to ask of three gentlemen, and 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 so um, one thing that my council has asked me to do is figure out a staffing plan from the city to help support this, um, so that they can be champions, but we can help uh, with a lot of administrative overhead and, and whatnot. I I, I will say, um, well, well, most of this was done. We did have. Um, our contractors install the signs, but we, we just included that as our overhead stuff that we do. Um, but um, at, as part of the city of Eastville, we're really looking to create an Eastville Connects and, and a connected community is a safe community. And Neighborhood Watch is one of the components of this Eastville Connects. And we're looking at creating a big umbrella of Eastville Connects and, and having the, the neighborhood watch be one component of it among other components um, that really help our residents um, and, um, get connected. Uh, on Saturday night, we went to the Eastvale Chinese American Association um, uh, full moon celebration and really connected with our Chinese community and here in Eastvale. And, and we're working to break down barriers between our different cultural ethnicities uh, as well as connect our different cultural ethnicities and really celebrate. And I, I, I told the uh, Eastville Chinese um, American Association, you know, next year it'll be even better when we have a whole bunch of different cultures here experiencing your culture, right? And, and learning about your culture and, and connecting with our, our Asian Americans uh, here in, in, in Eastville. And so um, just really celebrating our diversity and, and really connecting our community so that our residents know each other and, and they care about each other um, and, and they're there to help each other on um, kudos to our code enforcement team on Friday. We, we sat down with the, the faith-based organizations on Friday and said, hey, you know, we are a, 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 a very uh, wealthy community, um, but we do have people that occasionally need to be loved on in our community too and cared for. Um, and we don't all have all, all the social services at the local agency level, but a lot of our faith-based organizations are, are starving to serve people in our community. And so uh, occasionally we get a complaint about somebody's front yard being 12 inches tall. And rather than being critical of them, we go up and knock on their door and we, we find somebody that might be on hospice in the front, front, front window or, or, or in the home, they're having a hard, uh, financially a hard time. And now we have the connection with the faith-based community to 
hey, can you go over there and take care of their yards while they're while, while they're in a time of need, right? And, and really giving the community a power to serve each other. And I think that's a great opportunity. I think this is just one of the many components of Eastville Connects. And we're excited to think really big about this and take it to the next level and be a we are already a, a national best practices for neighborhood watch, but even take it to the next, the best of the galaxy, so to speak, and, and see what we can do so that everybody's coming and putting Eastville on the map as far as public safety. And, and you know, this neighborhood watch program is why um, we're the number 17th place, the best city to live in in the nation by Time Magazine or Time Money Magazine or one of those Time, Time Magazine, yes. And, and realestate.com. So, I mean, when, when, when you're looking at those things, um, it, these, you know, while, while public safety is a, a number one priority, uh, we're, we're taking things um, uh, head on and, and really making a priority. So I want to thank Don and all the efforts of, of all the captains in the community and, and for you guys uh, supporting uh, this public safety movement that we're trying to do from a grassroots effort in a, in a, in a small, young community. So thank you. Uh, Brian and I are going with the, Atl the uh, Western Atlantic uh, space shot, and we're going to be going up to the moon to give our presentation, I think. So the galaxy part. Only a small expenditure on the city budget. T t t it's, it's donated by Tesla. We already talked. Thank you, Brian, for the update, along with Don. So, so you'll see uh, like a mid-year budget adjustment or something like that for for uh, uh, for the rocket ship. No, but but for staffing levels, we're going to try to present something uh, to council so that we can get that position and, and support our neighborhood watch program. Very good. All matters on the consent calendar are considered routine and are to be approved with one motion unless a commissioner, staff member, or a member of the public requests separate action on a specific item. Has any item been requested to be pulled? No, sir. Commissioners, any items you'd like to pull? No. A motion's in order to accept the consent calendar at this time. Make a motion to accept the consent Mike. calendar. Mike. 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 I second the motion. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Commissioner Dinko? Aye. My, Commissioner Ward? Aye. Chair DaCosta? Aye. Motion passes 3-0. Commission business items. Truck route ordinance. Craig? Good evening. Um, good evening, uh, Chair DaCosta and Commissioners. Um, I'm looking at this item and I'm looking at uh, the Commissioners. I'm, I know Chair DaCosta was here when we had the original hearings and uh, and uh, Sean Perea was here. We are yet we're commissioners Ward or Dinko here. <laughs> Maybe just caught the very end of it, just the very end of it. Okay, so we'll probably back up a little bit. Uh, this is kind of somewhat of an old project. Um, just to give you a little bit of summary, of what truck route ordinance really is. A truck route in order to, have, to create a truck route ordinance, it's necessary to have a truck route study. We had about a hundred page. A study that was prepared by a professional engineering firm, uh, Miniger and Associates, and they took uh, truck counts. Uh, they also survey surveyed uh, the neighboring cities as far as uh, connectivity goes, and uh, put together a truck route map of, of uh, what uh, they felt would be necessary to have um, truck routes in our city. We also surveyed the trucking industry. Uh, Goodman was involved. We had. Um, we had uh, an ad hoc committee that was also formed that consisted of uh, two commissioners from planning, uh, commission, public safety, and we had uh, two, two at-large at uh, uh, participants also. And we went through quite a process that started in January and kind of concluded uh, in June of 2017. So it's been a while ago. Uh, about May of 2017, uh, Commissioner Priya, he brought up the issue of terminal truck routes, of terminal trucks. Terminal trucks are oversized trucks. They're trucks uh, that are longer than 65 feet. Uh, and uh, just half the trucks or two-thirds of the trucks out there seem to be over that size limit. Uh, any truck uh, trailer that says 53 on the side, that means 
the trailer is 53 feet long, they all automatically become what we call a terminal truck or an oversized truck, over length truck. Um, and if they have a sleeper cab, just a sleeper cab pushes them over the limit. Um, not a lot of neighboring cities really enforce it, enforce this. Uh, the, the current terminal truck route in the area is really I-15. That's it. And I think Long Beach, where uh, uh, Commissioner Perea works, they have different terminal truck routes through the city. But it's important because the turning radiuses are different, and some streets work and some streets don't. Um, we started back in May of 2017. When this issue came up, we started in May of 2017 uh, uh, going through Caltrans to see if we could get Cantu Galliano uh, that off-ramp can uh, be a terminal truck route off-ramp. And uh, it's taken almost a year and a half to get approvals through Caltrans due to the geometry and uh, changes that had to be made. Um, we didn't have enough uh, width for um, the shoulder that required an exception. It was quite a process. We just recently got approval. And uh, the, this terminal truck route uh, is part of this ordinance. Uh, just real quick, let me explain what the tr actual terminal truck route is, it utilizes Cantu Galliano, uh, goes down to Goodman, then goes south on Goodman Avenue, which comes and wraps around down to, to Hamner Avenue, and then you go north on Hamner, back to Cantu, and back on the freeway. It's that little tiny loop. Uh, we could probably call it the Amazon loop, but there's a lot of uh, those size trucks. We, we did a survey of the parking lot behind Amazon, and uh, a lot of those trucks are oversized. And, but with this ordinance, it will allow them to use that route, and only that route uh, within the city. Uh, the, the turning radiuses work, uh, it's designed for these larger trucks. And so that was what's kind of held up this truck route ordinance. The truck route ordinance itself, and, and this terminal truck route portion of it, um, we have to have that in place so we have enforceable uh, truck routes within the city and to, to let the trucks know what streets they can legally go on. And um, just the, the, the truck routes themselves, I think they're pretty straightforward. This went through quite a bit of study and analysis and legally what we could uh, do to allow for trucks to pass through the city. There, there's codes and sections and so forth that uh, are stated in the vehicle code. Uh, there's, a, there's a requirement for us to have some sort of a truck route uh, through the city. And uh, so the, the cre creation of this ordinance and adoption of this ordinance allows us to enforce these truck routes. But Hamner Avenue is one of the logical truck routes. Uh, it's connected uh, to the north with uh, on Ontario's truck route and to the south with the city of Norco's truck route. Uh, of course, Limonite, it connects to the I-15 interchange. Uh, that's uh, a truck route that's uh, proposed here. Archibald Avenue, it connects to the north with the city of Ontario and to the south uh, with the city of Norco. And so you've got Archibald Avenue and also Hellman Avenue. Hellman Avenue is uh, currently a truck route for southbound in Chino. And so for northbound, uh, that it, it's the logical connection. And uh, we've coordinated all this with the neighboring cities so, so that everybody's in agreement. And we also show some dashed lines where potential future truck routes uh, uh, could, could occur, you know, if the roadway goes through a portion of Limonite, uh, when that goes through, that, that would be automatically a portion of the truck route. Um, that's, the, that's the truck routes that are proposed within the city. Um, that's really, this, this map right here is the study. This is the results of the truck route study. Uh, and just in a visual picture. And um, maybe with that, uh, I'd, I'd be glad to open it this time for questions. Uh, what we're going to be asking for is approval of uh, the truck route ordinance that's attached and uh, approval of uh, making a couple modifications to the municipal code. Uh, the idea is to go to city council in October for the first and second reading. And then come January 1st, we will we'll, we'll have had uh, all the truck routes posted and they will be enforceable. So with that, I'd, I'd be, staff would be glad to answer questions. Yeah, I have a few. Great. Uh, Sorry, there we go. Credit Commissioner Ward, thank you. Um, are there any exceptions to the uh, terminal truck routes? And what I mean by that is, I think you said it was 53. 
Right. If, 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 you, if you see a 53 on a trailer, they're, they're oversized. They're beyond the 40-foot standard trailer. And so it's, 50, it's actually 65 feet from one end to the other end, the total length. As soon as they go beyond that length, they're over length, oversized trucks. Okay. And the routes that these tru trucks will be traveling through Eastville, and you laid that out really well. Thank you. Um, is there a time exception on them? And is there also uh, an exception as it relates to uh, traffic conditions within the city? Like, let's say the city has a really, really bad traffic jam. Then is there an exception that allows these trucks to go another route, if you know? No. The, the vehicle code allows a truck, if they're making a, deriv a delivery to a point, allows them to use the, the, the most direct point. I mean, they would take an arterial, a major street, then they take a collector, then perhaps if they're making a home delivery, uh, uh, say it's a moving truck, they can go to that home and make a delivery. But then they need to come back out. Um, the truck routes are really intended for through truck traffic. Uh, trucks that are passing through have to use those truck routes or they can be ticketed. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Craig, Commissioner Dinko, I just I'm coming into the, this right. conversation a little I understand bit. Light, perfectly. But I'm just going to make a, a quick observation, and uh, I, I see that obviously Schleisman turns into Pine, which goes to the 71. So correct. And it looks like um, you have a future interchange circled at the 15 and Schleisman. Right. I appreciate the fact that we haven't um, and moved to make the entire Schleisman a proposed truck route but of course that'll probably be difficult uh, you know in the future once there's an actual interchange there are there any thoughts on how we can try to avoid that situation in the future is there any way to mitigate that yeah. when if we have an interchange on one side and the 71 yeah to the far west i'm not sure if there's anything we, we can do we had quite a few discussions about just excluding the portion of slicemen we've ex excluded and the argument was if we've got schools there there's a lot of pedestrians there and is it really needed to get through the city it really doesn't connect uh you know you can you've got hammer and archibald if you want to go north south through the city that's kind of our attitude um, that's so far down the road, I would even hazard to make a guess on where, where that may go. We, um, no, I appreciate yeah, that. Uh, I know it's just future thoughts. I, yeah. I just wanted to make that observation. Sure. I didn't know if there's I know, city any way to try to mitigate that in the, in the future. Maybe not. Commissioner Dinko, it, it's it's not our desire to have Slicemen be a truck route. Uh, um, and... Um, even currently right now with Sliceman and Archibald, um, that is just a route because Limonite is not connected. And in the future, when Limonite is connected, we can revisit maybe removing uh, Sliceman and Archibald as part of the truck route. Um, that was something that was brought up by our planning commission last week. Um, there's a concern that Archibald coming up through the community, um, why not use Hellman and just instead of having two parallel routes coming from the south, just have people use River Road to Hellman and up to Lima and, and connect rather than having them cut through our community. We'd like to preserve as many of our streets uh, uh, for for our, our children that are trying to get to our great parks and schools and enhance the safety. And there's an, an inherent danger uh, with uh, 80 ton or 40 ton trucks <laughs> uh, trying to use our community. And so we, we can appreciate while they need to make deliveries in our community, but when they're cutting from Chino over to the 15, we'd like them to stay on our truck routes as much as possible. Um, so when you're driving through our community, we want you to stay on the truck routes. And that's the message we're trying to send to the trucking community. And we'll be working with our, our Eastvale Police Department. I, I want to make sure that we, 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 we try really hard to brand our Eastvale Police Department rather than, and while, while it is, uh, we are contracted with the Riverside Sheriff's Office, uh, uh, they are our Eastvale Police Department. And, and, and in the city of Eastvale, we want to call them our Eastvale Police Department. So um, that's why we put a... Uh, uh, um, uh, shoulder patch on them and, the, and we have them drive the cars that say Eastville Police Department. It, it's a, a little training opera uh, uh, because we have a lot of people that are used to calling them the RSO, but uh, we're working to rebrand that because it's important to our uh, to many of our residents. So Nothing wrong with the Sheriff's Department, though. <laughs> no, there's nothing wrong with the Sheriff's Department. Craig, I just have a quick follow-up question yes. again. If you know, did the study indicate what type of trucks... Uh, 
terminal trucks would be entering uh, East Fairland. I know that you told me the size of them, but the, the cargo that they would particularly be carrying, did it indicate that at no, all? No, it doesn't talk about cargo whatsoever. I mean, there, there's, there's, there's requirements as far as what's legal and what's not. But you, we, we do know that, uh, that there's, a, there's a lot of cargo that, that's trans, transported along the 15, along these corridors that come, comes from uh, the ports in LA and Long Beach. Uh, and it, it, could, it could be all sorts of things. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sure. I appreciate the at-length study, the follow-up, the follow-through, and the sharing of this map. In my review of all the data that was presented, a couple of questions that came to light in conversation tonight, as you were mentioning, the 53-foot trailer with a sleeper cab, I'm aware of a common occurrence of seeing trailers of that type parked on Hellman and Chino Corona Road, where I have reported to Chino PD when it's been on Chino's side of the street. But I'm curious to know, and maybe since we have a RSO in the building, they could answer this as well. Um, not to put you on the spot, sir. But when it comes to parking a semi trailer, Will this uh, ordinance cover that? I know that there's enforceable capabilities that the law enforcement agencies have uh, within their right. vehicle code book and so forth. We, we have a, you want to jump into this commercial? Sorry. Ordinance? There's commercial uh, parking, commercial enforcement uh, ordinance that's going to be coming uh, in the future. We're working okay. through a few kinks. We're hoping to bring it at the same time, but we're, we're not able to. But in the next couple months, uh, that commercial parking ordinance will come forward. And I'm also enlightened once again, having heard about the future interchange, then it was not going to be one, and then I see one again. So um, do we know a time frame on when that might occur? The future uh, interchange that's considered the extension of Sliceman, what also was named A Street, I believe. but. Commissioner DaCosta, there is no time frame and there is no funding for that interchange. So mm -hmm. a, a new interchange is anywhere from 50 to $100 million. Uh, there is no regional money that is identified for that interchange. Uh, Harupa Valley and Norco have both removed it from their city's plans. So we are the only remaining city. Mm -hmm. And it's something that I have brought up with Western Riverside COG that we need to have a discussion about. Is this just a pipe dream, or can can it actually happen, right. and and will it happen? And so, if 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 we're the only ones with a dog in the in the race, so to speak, uh, and no one else is pulling for it, um, is it going to happen? And we need to have that candid conversation with our regional partners to to um, either put it on the map or take it off the map. But we can't be sitting on the fence anymore. So. Understood. And uh, of all nights, I wish Sean was here tonight. It would have been perfect if he was here. Because <laughs> I'm sure he'd have more questions than I could even think of to throw at. But I do appreciate the at-length study. Um, I guess is the time when we are to... I just have one final question. Go ahead, I'll, please. I'll the... Chief. Chief. From listening to this proposal, are there any concerns that you have uh, about the uh, terminal truck route and how it might affect, um, you know, your emergency services or anything of that nature, sir? No, we don't have any concerns with the terminal truck route coming in. Uh, we wouldn't have any difference in, in our responses to those. Uh, as you know, we have two engines that are in the city. We've also got the truck company in, in Harupa Valley that we have at our disposal. Uh, if we have any accidents involving the, the larger big rigs, we have all the equipment to be able to, to handle any of those types of accidents. Okay, thank you, sir. I think the one last question I have, have we made contact with any CHP agents or agency in our region for the purposes of assistance with truck concerns or enforcement outside the scope that RSO might have the ability to monitor? You know, we, we have not. Uh, I think the, the study did a survey and it, it cites some some uh, sections that are that have to do with CHP. But the I-15 is a terminal truck route. Yes. And, and shortly, when this ordinance pa passes, we, we will make, uh, you know, Caltrans is prepared to make the off-ramp and on-ramp of Canto Galliano terminal off-ramps and on-ramps, and they'll sign it. It'll be a blue sign with a T on it. 
okay. and that's the terminal truck route sign, and uh, and it, it that that means that that off ramp and and also our truck route uh, terminal truck route when we'll sign it with the T with the blue sign, uh, that means it meets all the the legal radiuses for turning and so forth, and uh, I, I I don't think there will be any problems with that. Um, Sir, we have a commercial trucking uh, enforcement officer at the Root Valley Station. Yes, uh, and we also have uh, Officer Medina, who's assigned to Eastville. She has a lot of commercial training, uh, so we'll be able to utilize those two to do commercial enforcement in the city. Thank you. And it'll be to have to well, set aside some funding and stuff like that for overtime and things like that. But we can work on that. So. Definitely. Thank you. Just trying to get all the questions out there. In Sean's absence. Well, we can also use our, our new traffic motor units to also address some of this. So, so if, if we need to do that and work with the East Hill Police Department, we can. I, we're going to have a new motor units starting in quarter one of 2019, uh, an additional uh, uh, full time motor officer in, in, in the city. So we'll have two motor officers on, on motorcycles uh, patrolling. So now when you see one, you, you, you have to think you might see a second one down the way rather than now I can speed since I saw where the motor officer is. So <laughs> let's not give out too many strategies. Yes. Right? <laughs> so motion is in order to accept. I'll make that motion. Uh, do you want to open a public hearing? Oh, yes, please. At this time, we'll open up for any public comment. Any member of the public may address the commission on items within the commission's subject matter jurisdiction, which are not listed on this agenda during public comments. However, well, no action may be taken on matters that are not part of the posted agenda. And <laughs> since this is an agenda item, any comments Sorry made? About that. <laughs> that was my fault. <laughs> That's all right. You can continue. Any comments made will be limited to a time frame, and the clock is there for us to monitor. Any public comments at this time regarding the truck ordinance for the city of Eastvale? I haven't received any. Very good. Okay. Seeing none? Nope. Motion is now in order. I second the motion. You mean the first motion? I thought he faded the first motion. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that was more. All right. The truck ordinance. Commissioner Dinko? Aye. Commissioner Ward? Aye. Chair DeCosta? Aye. Motion item passes 3 0. Thank you, Craig. Thank you. And now, once again, public comments. Having received any? I haven't received any. We move on to the city staff report, item 7. Good evening, commissioners. I do have a few updates um, from the communications side of things. I will keep this short and sweet. Speaking of interchanges, we will be celebrating our Limonai Avenue um, interchange project groundbreaking tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. We hope you will join us. Um, it's not typical for a groundbreaking to happen after the fact that ground has broken and it is indeed in full swing, but that is just a true testament to how important this project is and more importantly how um, we want this to be a timely project and get it out of the way as soon as we can. We are anticipating the completion um, by December of 2019. We're hoping for November. The idea and the goal is to only have to impact one holiday season. So um, I do have good news for this week's construction update for that project. There are no anticipated road closures this week and I don't know if they did that on purpose to, because we're celebrating tomorrow or, or what the deal is, but no complaints. Um, in fact, on social media, we did a fun poll and asked who was happy and everyone is happy, um, specifically on Instagram. And then um, on- I'm sorry, yes. did you say everybody was happy on social media? Um, on Instagram, the, oh, as of yesterday, um, related to no closures this week. You're welcome. Um, I, on that note, we, we realize that there have been quite a few concerns and frustrations and rightfully so. We, we understand and appreciate all of the concerns that have come out of um, 
traffic impacts related to both the um, interchange project as well as other uh, projects, uh, specifically the o annual overlay project that has been impacting traffic flow. And we get it and we understand it. Um, being that the interchange is approximately 14 months long, it's a longer project and it's hard to put off other maintenance related uh, construction project or road improvement projects, I should say. So we appreciate everyone's patience during this time. We want to make sure that we keep the roads safe and well maintained so we don't have issues later on that will cause um, costly um, it won't cost us more money in the future. So we do appreciate everyone's patience and we're looking forward to the overlay project being out of the way by November at the latest. And the Hamner widening project will be completed in the next week, week and a half. So that will definitely help traffic impacts um, and alleviate the congestion on Hamner. I've experienced it myself and I understand. <laughs> so um, this upcoming or tomorrow, I should first remind everyone that we will be having our next city council meeting. And I'm sure our council members are looking forward to the brand new dais. So you guys can let them know how it is. And uh, that will be here at 6.30 p.m. This upcoming Saturday, we want to remind you to join us for the next residential cleanup and paper shredding event. We can always use extra volunteers and help that day. It's from 8 to 12 at Augustine Ramirez Intermediate School, and we're looking forward to a successful event. Um, for more details, you can visit our website. October 6th it, um, is a full day. We will be having a few different celebrations. As Dawn had mentioned, the Eastvale Neighborhood Watch celebration will be from 10 to 1 at Harada Heritage Park. And then following that event, um, beginning at 3 p.m., will be the annual Fall Festival. And we're super excited about that because we're going to be celebrating our eighth birthday as a city. So join us for some cupcakes and punch and lemonade. I haven't decided. Maybe some ice cream, but there will be sweets. And October 9th, we're excited to partner in a free emergency preparedness and family safety fair. Um, and it's going to be at the Harupa Area Recreation and Park District from 5 to 8. More details on our website. And on that note of emergency preparedness, this month is emergency preparedness month. And um, we want to remind everyone to make a plan to um, make a communications plan to pack an emergency kit. You can pack one in your car. You should have one for both your car and your home. Um, and more information on how to put a kit together is on our website. And we also are thrilled to share our next CERT class is completely full. Um, there's four, There were four, 40 seats available and they're all full and that's going to be on October 12th through the 14th. And we're in the process of scheduling the next CERT classes. So we hope to combine um, our CERT efforts and trainings in collaboration with our Neighborhood Watch program and um, we're excited to see what that looks like. But that's all I, oh, and save the date for the open house that Brian had previously mentioned. It will be here on October 24th at 5.30 prior to our city council meeting. That's all I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions. No questions. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. I think we're good. Um, we're excited to uh, really take um, a proactive look and, and keeping eyes and ears out there and, and enhancing the safety of our community. And we appreciate you guys as commissioners uh, providing some guidance and recommendations to us and our council um, and serving on this commission. So thank you very much for your time and your commitment to the city. Thank you. Item eight, commission communications. Commissioner Dinko? Nothing. Nothing. Commissioner Ward. No, sir. Okay. So, uh, Brian and Olivia, I know you've seen some of the items that Adam and I have been discussing lately as we met last week, one of which is the water treatment plant in the south end of the city in hopes that we might try to uh, address that concern that many citizens in that region are having a heightened awareness to its presence and they're addressing 
or wanting to address the concerns as they continue to make complaints repeatedly to AQMD. And uh, one of the items that was discussed was with Adam and I was the hope that we might be able to partner with JCSD as well as AQMD and get an EIR, an environmental impact report, to share with the residents in an upcoming city council meeting. So I don't know. I know we've had some dialogue behind the scenes, and I just wanted to uh, be proactively uh, stating that. For so, so we've already reached out uh, to JCSD's general manager, Todd Corbin, and we've asked him uh, to join uh, the city council on October 10th at their council meeting, and we'll identify if he's available for that uh, so that he can come and uh, along with AQMD and prepare some of the analysis that, that they've been doing down there, as well as update uh, our council on some of the changes that they've been making in the in to address some of the complaints um, and and the criteria by which they're evaluating um, and then uh, steps moving forward. We'll also try to reach out and identify, can we do a joint meeting so that the elected officials can have a policy discussion on this, uh, this matter? Um, you know, Todd is uh, very aware of the concerns of some of the residents in the region. Um, and, um, you know, it, and we are empathetic uh, to some of the challenges as well. Uh, there, there are some days when we smell the dairy uh, here at Eastfield Gateway more than others. Um, 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 and um, and just like uh, there are some days when you guys uh, smell the, 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 the wastewater treatment plant as well. So um, it's uh, land uses in proximity to each other don't always work uh, to the greatest of their abilities. And so, uh, but we have to figure out how to be good neighbors with each other. So um, we'll, we'll definitely see if there's things that Todd has in mind uh, and to address some of the residents and what they're doing. Um, but they did just spend about $80 million down there to my understanding to, to make some upgrades. So uh, we'll have to figure out how that is either enhancing or not enhancing the solution. So, uh, but we want to identify what the problem is or we know what the problem is, but figure out how do we have all the right stakeholders uh, to, to work towards a solution if there is a solution. So thank you for that. So we'll allow the two Todd's to get back to us, yes. Corbin and Rigby. Uh, the other item for, discussion that came up was the cameras. We had um, some of the cameras that were being recalled as a result of other upgrades or some, one of them was still under warranty. And these are the cameras that are mounted around the city that had the uh, blue indicators to let us know that uh, they were monitored continually. And uh, one had been located on Schleisman and Archibald on the southeast corner. I do know that that was one that was, and maybe Craig can enlighten us or Joe, uh, if you guys know about those cameras where they're, and you don't have to disclose where they're placed necessarily, but how are we doing with the upgrades to the software or the equipment? Uh, and are they effective? Has it been effective for the sheriff's department and enforcement? Yeah. I believe it was six months or nine months ago, they, uh, uh, there's some hardware that uh, was not functioning properly and there was an upgrade and they come out and they replace those uh, upgrades. The resolution is much better than it was. Um, it, 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 you can actually read license plates if, you, if they're properly zoomed. Um, so I think that's improved quite a bit since that upgrade occurred. So we did use them uh, to help to tour some illegal dumping in one location in, in the community and, and they were very effective at reducing that. We at one point were bringing 40 yard dumpsters to pick up the, 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 um, the waste that was being dropped off uh, in our community. Um, we we're hoping that it wasn't Eastfell residents that were dumping it there and it was somebody in another community um, uh, adjacent to us. Um, um, but uh, the cameras did help uh, over the last few months deter that location. And so uh, we're, we're impressed with the, 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 the resolution. And, and we're also, with council funding, working to bring automatic license plate readers uh, to our community. And so um, that will be uh, rolling out probably within the next six months, uh, working with the Eastfield Police Department to um, have automatic license plate readers as people are coming into and out of our community on different roads. So we're gonna be spending about uh, 
eight hundred thousand dollars on automated license plate, and a lot of communities have been very effective uh, in in deterring crime as well as uh, uh, capturing known criminals coming in and out of the community. So um, we, we're going to be working very closely with our agency partners uh, to implement those as well. So um, use it, utilizing technology to improve our uh, effectiveness with public safety. So That's good news. Um, so with the license plate readers, that's going to be the sheriff's department Vehicles will be equipped with those. The Eastvale Police Department will Eastvale be, equipped, Police will Department. be, will be equipped with those. Yes. Thank you for the correction. So, I, so the I Eastvale stopped. Police, uh, the Eastvale Police Department will be equipped as well as they will be on fixed uh, traffic signal poles, where thirty thousand cars will be going by them a day. So, uh, um, so there will be a number of locations, uh, and and they're just little small little rectangular devices that sit on the the crossbar uh, uh, or the ma uh, mast arm of the traffic signal pole and they go out over the lanes and as you're driving through the intersection and leaving the intersection they capture your license your rear license plate and record that and so if if it's a stolen vehicle or a, a vehicle of known uh, criminal activity that's coming into our community it'll ping all of our uh, our police officers uh, and let them know that um, they are, we, we have somebody in the area and then they can do a saturation patrol to look for that vehicle in that, in that area. So they will also be on some mobile units as well so that as they're driving around, if something and it pings and says the car next to you is a, a, norm, a, a known felon um, or, or this car is stolen or was involved in a criminal activity that they can uh, get involved at that point as well at, to, per their discretion. Well, that's good news. I didn't know they were going to be affixed around the city as well as on the Eastville Police the, Department the, 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 vehicles. Yeah, thank you. Uh, it, it's the most effective way to allow other cars just to pass by and, and, and put it on a fixed area, you know, like on Limonite or on Hamner, where you'll have tens of thousands of cars driving by. And so as people come into our community as visitors or guests uh, um, or as shopping retailers or come in to, to visit us at Silver Lakes in Southeastville, um, that we can um, uh, um, keep our community safe fr from criminal activity. So, With that, I have to say that I'm glad to know with the upgrade of the equipment to the cameras strategically placed around the city that they're able to capture license plates now. I know that they were not able to do so in the beginning. Very good. Uh, the last topic I think for discussion uh, that came about from our meeting, Adam and mine, was regarding vagrancy. As we know we have um, quite the increase of homelessness in more so the riverbed area but in some other parts of the city as well. There's Albertsons and some of the shopping centers, we do see an increase of individuals and not so much families as might have been uh, misleading by some of the panhandling that had been taking place for a time. And I do know we have a panhandling ordinance now. Yes, we, we in the springtime, it, it was brought before the Public Safety Commission as well as City Council, and we adopted the aggressive panhandling ordinance. We're also, uh, per the request of City Council, working on putting uh, um, uh, anti-panhandling signs up. Don't say no to panhandling in our community, something similar to what, what is uh, in Upland, just to communicate, uh, don't encourage panhandling, uh, that we have social services throughout the region to help with the homeless issue. Um, um, and f provide homes, uh, housing, and, and social services for our homeless population. It, it should be noted that we, we still have, as our last count in Eastvale, we have zero people, uh, zero homeless people living in Eastvale. Um, now, there there is a difference between day laborers at some of our establishments, as well as panhandlers uh, and transient homeless people moving through our community. Um, but um, we work with the, the homeless outreach team uh, and as part of our contract with the Riverside Sheriff's Office um, and uh, in talking with her, uh, one of the homeless outreach team officers, she, she, we, she is at our disposal whenever we need her in this community to help with the social services and needs of a homeless population or a homeless person in our community. Um, and we are staying proactive and on top of that issue. So um, we are not dealing with the issues that many of our 
uh, regional agency partners are because of how we are uh, proactively helping individuals that um, and getting them to the right social services needs in, in the region. So um, there and they all exist over at the city of Riverside. So. Um, uh, um, Yeah, so November 14th, we're going to update the, 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 the city council on our homeless outreach uh, task force per their request. So Thank you. Last item more that was discussed, and this is just more of a, a, a commendation to the sheriff's department, Eastvale Police Department, as I stand corrected, but the crime reports, I know we've had some controversial uh, conversations and uh, with city council and the way that the reports were coming down but I wanted to make it known that they are appreciative of the information and the data as it's been coming out and so I just wanted to reiterate the kudos and continued great work by all involved so thank you that concludes my uh, communications future agenda items. Any from the commissioners? Seeing none. Motion is in order to adjourn. 724. Thank you.